the Shelly start. Uh, <coughs> our first talk is uh, will be presented by uh, Professor Yongju Park uh, at uh, Seoul National University. Uh, please welcome him. Thank you for the kind introduction. And also I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Professor Zhou, especially uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Um, and so today, um, well, I, I noticed that, like that this session is like, like the first talk was about quite relevant to biology. The second talk was um, more theoretical in general. The third talk was again very biological. And now as you can predict, uh, this talk is going to be a very um, theoretical or speculative. So, uh, so I'm sorry for if, if you feel that this is not really relevant to biology, but, but I think uh, what I'm going to talk about today might be happening in a system which looks like this. So um, like, let's say you have some kind of swimming bacteria in some kind of solution, and then you have a very symmetrically shaped object or a tracer particle uh, which is being pushed here and there uh, by these bacteria, or these swimming bacteria. And uh, I'm going to talk about some kind of very, which appears like a very direct mechanism for some kind of uh, symmetry breaking phenomena associated with the motility of this tracer particle uh, in a dilute active fluid where you can treat these bacteria almost like some kind of ideal gas particles. So this work was done uh, in collaboration with uh, my students, Kiwan Kim and Yunshik Che. Kiwan Kim is sitting somewhere here, I think. If not, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I okay. I talk with him later. So um, okay, let's begin. So I, I think I'm the first speaker who is really talking about active matter. So um, so let me first introduce the concept. So here is the very uh, representative example of active matter, the E. coli. So as you can see here, E. coli. Maybe many of you have already seen this movie, but it swims by uh, moving its uh, flagella at the end. It's shaped, it's shaped like a, like an oblong uh, ellipsoid, and uh, like it keeps moving in a straight line for some time, and then at some given rate, it then starts like rotating, you know, tumbling, in, in, in like the same position, and then then it starts running again. So basically, the motion of this kind of um, bacteria can be simplified like this. So basically, you understand this to be like a series of straight runs punctuated by random tumbles at a given rate to a random direction. So this is called one and tumble dynamics, understandably. So this is a very simple example of active matter, active particle. So how is it different from non-active particle, or passive particle? So uh, here's a very schematic uh, diagram showing the difference. So in the case of passive particle doing the usual thermal Brownian motion, you can see this particle with some kind of mechanical energy exchanging energy with the surroundings, the form of heat or work. And you typically like a model of the dynamics using some kind of Langevin equation. Um, so here you have the drag force, the friction force, and you have some kind of potential conservative interactions with the surroundings, and also you can have some kind of thermal noise. But if, for this kind of Brownian particle, what uh, happens is that the, the system, the particle satisfies fluctuation, dissipation relation. So the way the particle dissipates its energy to the environment and the way the particle absorbs energy from the environment has some kind of time reversal symmetry. So, so therefore the fluctuations, the sort of fluctuations in the environment and the way you lose energy to the environment by dissipation is actually related by temperature. So this is called, uh, this fluctuation dissipation relation ensures a time reversal symmetry of the heat dissipation and heat ex, uh, absorption. And uh, so this kind of particle uh, can reach equilibrium at some given temperature. But in contrast, so uh, for the active particle like this bacteria, uh, so, so naturally you can see that this particle has some kind of separate source of energy other than the heat, uh, the, the heat from the surroundings. So it has an ambient or stored energy in the form, for example, the chemical fuel, and then it converts that to mechanical energy, and then in turn, that is dissipated into the environment. So because of this extra uh, source of energy, uh, in addition to the usual uh, 
terms appearing in the Longevin equation for the Brownian particle. You have some additional things here. For example, like this propulsion force, uh, which is highlighted by purple here. So there is some kind of non-concerted self propulsion force, which uh, actually um, is in addition to the summer interaction. Therefore, this additional term is not necessarily related to the dissipation uh, by any fluctuation dissipation relation. And what is more is like this force is actually determined, the direction of this force is determined by the, the shape of the particle, for, for example, the body shape of the bacteria. And then like it takes some time usually until the direction changes. So, so these are like the, the time reverse metric breaking and the, this, uh, the direction, the importance of the direction of the body are like very important properties of uh, active particles, active matter. So you can find these kinds of active particles at various length scales and time scales uh, as shown here, like from like nanometer scale uh, with molecular motors uh, through bacteria and insects to the all the way to the birds at the middle scale. So that the common properties of these things, these particles, that they all of them con like converge toward the ambient energy into systematic motion. And they stay far from equilibrium by breaking time of symmetry, the fluctuating dissipation relation, and then each of them has some kind of direction of motion or determined by their body shape. Okay, so remembering this, uh, let's, uh, let me talk about like, how you can like, distinguish a system consisting of such active particles from a system consisting only of passive particles. So let's say you drop some so asymmetric object that looks like this, this, this wedge inside, an active uh, inside some fluid, okay? So Provided that the fluid is only consisting of passive particles, then the pressure acting on this object is the same everywhere, and therefore this object will not really travel anywhere except for some kind of summer diffusion. So there is not going to be any persistent motion. But if these particles, the circular particles, are active particles, then what happens is that they try to swim in the same direction for some time. So what happens is that the particle, active particles coming from the left like collide into the concave wall and then they cannot ex actually escape quickly because to escape they really need to turn their direction by a lot, by a large angle and that takes time. On the other hand, the particles which are coming from the right can just slide by the object without really having to turn their direction. So therefore, this leads to a surplus of density on the concave side of this wedge-like object. And that means there are like more particles pushing this wedge-like object to the right compared to the particles pushing this object to the left. So that leads to the net motion of this object to the right. And in response, the net current of active particles to the left. Similar thing happens on a situation on the right hand side here. Like as you can see, this, um, this, um, this, this is some kind of surface which has uh, some asymmetry from the right to left. And like the active particles with trajectory like A can easily slide by, but active particles with trajectory like B will get stuck in the trap. So this means uh, there is gonna be an overall force from the right to the left exerted by the active particles on this surface. So in general, these active particles like break time with symmetry, they are of equilibrium. And then if that is combined with some kind of asymmetric spatial geometry, then that leads to, that leads to uh, some kind of force on the body or some net current of the active particles, which we can utilize to obtain some kind of active motion or do some kind of useful work. So this is the main idea of utilizing active particles uh, to build some kind of like micro motors or very small scale of engines, uh, which was briefly discussed by uh, Hyung Gyo Park in the morning, uh, in, the, uh, in the talk before this. Uh, okay, so um, well, these were like a schematic drawings, but I mean, you can really see that these happen. So, I mean, these are actually very well known experiments uh, using a rich like object and a, like a gear like <laughs> object. And as you can see, uh, these objects are just moving. With, even though these active particles are really, really like dumb particles. They are just trying to move in the same direction and consequently they give rise to this kind of uh, rectified uh, motion. 
Okay, but so now here's the question. So uh, do we always need such asymmetric objects to induce like current or mortality uh, in this system? So that's what we are going to think about here. And the short answer is no. Actually, uh, we were not too, the first to say this answer. Actually, it's actually quite well known that there are some situations where uh, even symmetric situation can lead to uh, the overall um, current or ejected motion. So for example, let's say you drop some kind of flexible polymer in a fluid filled with active particles, active fluid. And then as you can see here, because of some kind of fluctuation, the polymer can have some kind of induced asymmetry. And then in response to the induced asymmetry, the active particles will form some kind of large scale current and also push the polymer in the opposite direction. So therefore that leads to very persistent motion and also depending on the length scale of the polymer, you can have persistent motion or persistent like rotation in the same place, or even if the length is not long enough, then uh, you will not get really persistent motion like it's shown in the left lower corner. Uh, well, anyway, yeah. So if the object can deform, then of course uh, you can get this kind of uh, uh, induced asymmetry and then consequently you can get a uh, directed motion. There is more complicated example. So I'm not gonna really explain what all these equations mean, but, uh, but this is a system which consists of um, this, this small filaments, um, like, myos uh, like, like actin, and then some like motor proteins which are like uh, grabbing these fil uh, filaments. And like what, what these motor proteins do is like they tend to align this protein filament. Uh, first of all, the protein filaments, like because of their shape, tend to align together. And then because of the presence of these motor proteins, they tend to get aligned with, some, with the same polarity. And also they tend to get some kind of contractile stress from the motor protein. Okay, and let's say uh, we gather these kind of uh, filaments together which, which, and, and, micro, and motor proteins, which will form what we call the active gel. So here are some like droplets of active gel inside some Newtonian fluid. And then what happens is that uh, they um, tend to form this kind of polar order because of the interactions I talk, talked about. But if you really strengthen the strengths of the water protein there, then the stress, the, the contractor stress, stress will get larger and larger. And then that will give rise to some kind of splay instability, which means the, like, if you, can, if you follow the grain of this, uh, polar, uh, the filaments, then they form a shape, they form a shape like this spontaneously. And then once this kind of uh, instability happens, then, uh, then there's an imbalance of stress across uh, this droplet, and then this droplet will be propelled in some direction. So as you increase the contractor activity of the molecular motors, then you can see this droplet uh, transitioning between some kind of stationary symmetric configuration to some asymmetric uh, moving configuration, which can be in both directions, depending on how you break the, uh, I mean, how, you, how the display stability happens. But still, okay. So, so these are examples of some examples of how symmetry breaking mortality can happen in active fluid. But, but all of these uh, like had some kind of some 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 kind of strict requirement. Like for example, in the first example, uh, the object didn't really have like um, fixed geometry. It was like it can be deformed very easily. And secondly, um, there was I mean. Um, the, the active fluid had to be like ordered beforehand. Like for example, in the case of the active gel, it had to, be, it had to have this um, like a polar order. But in our study, we are, we are actually gonna point out that even in an active fluid without any order, so it's just like an active ideal gas without any order, uh, still uh, the object immersed in it can be volatile through some kind of symmetry breaking mechanism induced by just the motion of the object. And negative drag, which means the drag force applied the same direction as the velocity of the object, uh, plays a very crucial role here. And both continuous and discontinuous phase transitions can happen. So here's a very a schematic diagram showing what is really happening there, but, but I'm gonna, uh, I mean, hang it in here just as a trailer. 
Okay, so um, actually, I think I have just like a, how many time I drive? How much time do I have? Uh, 15, ah, 15 minutes, okay. Okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, describe a very uh, simplistic theoretical model uh, that we sort to reach our conclusion. And then we are gonna uh, discuss what negative mobility means there, and negative, sorry, negative trajectory question means there. And then we are also gonna discuss what kind of phase changes happen there. So here's a very simplistic model of a one dimensional system with the object uh, immersed within some kind of active fluid. So here uh, we are considering a 1D system with periodic boundary condition for convenience. Actually, we are gonna send this L to infinity later. And um, so there are, in, in this one dimensional fluid, there are this uh, run and tumble particles. So since this is one dimensional the active particle, either travels to the right or travels to the left. And there's with the same velocity u, same speed u, and then it can tumble its direction with some kind of, some, some fixed rate alpha over two. And then, um, so, so I drew a circle to represent the periodic system, and then like these arrows are running particles, and the, 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 the this, uh, green triangle at the top is a really schematic drawing of how an object, a mover, mover object, interacts with the uh, running number particles. Okay, so let's have a look at it in detail. So, um, so, so as, as the distance between uh, the location of the active particle changes, so which is indicated by this X here. If the object, if the empty particle is on the right side of this object, then, um, then there will be a like, repulsive force to the right. And if the empty particle is on the left side of the object, then it's gonna have like the, some constant repulsive force to the left. So, this, uh, so the approach repulsion is like just on and off, and it's always like F or minus F. So that's why I, I drew a triangular potential representing the inter interaction. And by action and reaction principle, uh, the, the, this uh, object also exerts force on the active particles. Okay, so, um, so the equation motion can be written uh, used in, in this manner. The, there's the interaction be, uh, described by the potential V, the, uh, the triangular potential V that I showed before. And there's this uh, self propulsion force uh, following the run and tumble dynamics that's indicated by this USI. And um, the object itself moves, and um, uh, well, I'm just ignoring all the kind of possible noise here. I just assume that the object is an over, over damped particle, and when uh, the active particle is on the object, then uh, the object is pushed uh, in the corresponding direction. Uh, so what is important actually here is that this is a one-dimensional system, so, um, and the object and the uh, um, the active parts can interact when they're like, like kind of overlapping. So I, I'm assuming that this object is somewhat like a soft object. But the potential shape is not really deformed by the interaction. So the question is how this kind of object will move in the non-equilibrium steady state. So uh, I'm gonna assume that the, ob uh, first of all, uh, to solve this problem, uh, I'm going to use some kind of mean field approach. So I'm gonna assume that the object is moving at a constant velocity uh, through this active fluid. So then I can fix my frame of reference to a frame which is moving together with the object. And then since this is an over damped system, uh, you don't really have the Galilean invariance, you actually have some kind of medium around the uh, object. Therefore, like moving with the object means uh, there's an overall like, constant force in the opposite direction to the speed of the object. So you take that, speed, that, take that uh, like fixtures force into account, and then you can basically set up some kind of master equation uh, corresponding to this frame of reference, and then you try to uh, solve it for the steady state. Okay, so I skipped the detail. These are all just mathematics. The state state solution can be calculated actually exactly for any potential, in fact. Uh, and then you can calculate the drag force based on it. And then assuming that the speed of the object is small, then at linear order, then you get direct coefficient. 
And you can basically obtain the drag coefficient as a function of the persistent length of the active particle, which means how straight the active particle traces, how far the straight particle travels in a straight line, and also f, which is like the, the repulsion between the active particle and the object. So you get this kind of diagram. So the, well, the axis is the persistent length, and the vertical axis is the interaction strength. And when, when the, like, um, I mean, as you can see here in, in this red region, uh, in, in this in the region to the uh, lower right corner, uh, you get like negative drag, which means the drag force is in the direction of the motion. So, okay. And that happens when the egg persistent length is substantially larger compared to the object size, and when the wall repulsion is substantially small. So what exactly is happening here? So uh, let me uh, get some, um, uh, some exact solutions uh, for the like, shape of the density profile of the active particles at like zero order of the velocity and at linear of the order of the velocity. Okay, so this is a, actually this is a case for the like, passive Brownian particle. So when there's this like, potential, uh, which looks like this triangle drawn by the blue line here, then in response, the, brown, the density of the Brownian particles will be like this, uh, this, that inverted triangle, okay? Okay, actually not really triangle. Um, uh, okay, but anyway, yeah, I mean, it will have like lower density uh, within the object. Now, what happens if you move this object to the right? then there's some kind of like a fictitious drift to the opposite direction in the covering frame. And then like there are more passive particles in front of the object compared to uh, behind. And like this change of density basically means you are gonna have a drag force which is opposing the body motion. So this is like the like a pressure, uh, uh, some, fric some kind of friction like induced by pressure difference. So this is typically what happens in equilibrium situation, like for passive particles. But for active particles, something else can happen. So first of all, let's again start from an object at rest in an active fluid, and what would the density of the active particles look like? So as I said, uh, active particles tend to travel in the same direction for some time, and therefore when it meets a wall, then it tries to push against the wall for some time before turning away, okay? So that means uh, the active particles will kind of tend to accumulate at the wall as if there was some kind of like attraction. Of course, that's only caused by the like, persistence time of the travel. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now what happens when we start moving this object? Then what happens is that um, the active particles actually like pile up with a higher density behind the object. So um, that leads to some drag force which actually aids the motion. So this is the, what you call the, uh, the mechanism of negative mobility, negative drag. So let's try to get a bit of intuition into uh, about what is happening here. So let's say we have some kind of static body over there, the, the blue, blue triangle. Now, as I said, uh, when we have active particles around this uh, triangular object, triangular potential, uh, then these active particles move as if they are feeling some kind of effective attraction or towards the boundaries of this uh, object, okay? And they are also trying to go over the object. But since the right-hand side and left-hand side are symmetric, like the, the, the tendencies are balanced. But when we start to move this object, then what happens is that, uh, like for the right-hand side, the repulsion of the object is kind of a bit canceled by the fixtures force uh, due to the motion of the object. While on the left-hand side, the repulsion from the object is kind of strengthened by the fixtures force in the moving frame. 
So the object actually becomes a bit asymmetric like that. And then what that gives rise to is that like um, the active particles on the right hand side actually find it easier to go over the object than go to the left, while those on the left hand side find it more difficult to cross uh, this, this barrier. So therefore, there's, there's going to be a higher uh, number of active particles behind the object compared to the front. So this is a very hand-driving argument, but, but I think this is what uh, it is like roughly speaking happening in this situation. And again, um, we notice that this happens only when the person's length LP is substantially larger compared to the size of the object. So this is normalized by size of the object. As you can see, the negative drag happens only when LP is actually at least larger than like 0 0.4. And this might be because for this kind of mechanism to really occur, then the active particle has to actually sense both sides of the object without like losing any memory. So the active particle can travel from the left hand side to the right hand side and see that really because of the motion of this object uh, is potential has effectively become asymmetric. Now if the active particle is changing direction very quickly, then before even crossing this object, it will soon forget about what it felt before. So, so this, I mean, you have no information about uh, how asymmetric uh, this potential has effectively become in the moving frame. And that's actually kind, kind of equivalent to the equilibrium situation. Now, um, also we, uh, we uh, observe that the negative drag can happen only when the world repulsion is substantially small here. And that basically means uh, when the world repulsion is very, very strong, then, I mean, there will be like a few active particles really uh, like crossing at the object. So, so this basically most of the active particles will not be able to sense both sides of the object if the, 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 the world repulsion is too high. Uh, so sorry, again, here the force, force is um, is carried by the self propulsion force. So as you can see, uh, the whole region is below the, like the self propulsion force, uh, and so the, the world repulsion less than the self propulsion force. So negative drag can happen only in that region. Okay, so, so everything here is related to whether the active particle can sense both sides of the object. That's the, I think that's the important intuition you can gain from here. Um, okay, so basically, uh, so far I showed you a very specific example of a, like a triangular potential. And, but in, in principle, we can solve the equations for any kind of potential, and we've seen similar things happening for like sinusoidal potential and harmonic potential. And then for a very general kind of potential, actually we can do the perturb perturbative uh, analysis, assuming that the potential strength is very small. And I'm, I'm not actually gonna really explain the detail, but, but assuming that the V itself is very small, then you can calculate the direct coefficient here as shown in this last formula. And as you can see, when the run length is substantially large, or when the potential, sorry, the repulsion is substantially strong, then you can get negative drag coefficient. Okay, for a general potential in, in the weak potential limit. So, so far I've shown you that like in the linear response regime, the friction felt by this object in an active fluid can be like negative, can be like in the direction of velocity. But of course, to get the steady state velocity, we actually need to go to the nonlinear uh, regime and then try to uh, solve some kind of um, self constant equation uh, between the drag force and the like, friction from other kind of friction from the environment. Okay, so, uh, so this is basically what mean field approximation does. So uh, we calculate, the, we do the mean field approximation and solve the uh, for the steady, so for the self constant equation, um, okay, I think I cannot really explain this diagram in a short while. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna tell you that like the, what the axis is like with, with carried repulsion, the vertical axis is like the object velocity, and the lines here are like the solutions uh, where the force from the environment is balanced by the force applied by the active particles on the object. 
Okay, and then uh, what they see is that depending on like the situation, uh, we can get uh, both uh, continuous phase transition of the velocity and like discrete jump of the velocity, state state velocity, as you vary the like the reproduction strengths while fixing the persistence length. So um, now you can uh, draw a sort of phase diagram based on the result. Uh, so again, on this uh, repulsion and persistence length plane, um, you get many kind of different, different kinds of possible um, steady state behaviors. So for example, we have this immobile regime where for whatever the velocity V is, uh, you never really have like positive uh, force in the direction of the motion. Uh, so that's what this I represents. Then there's the mobile regime where for small velocity you get some like negative drag overall and then, then soon as you increase the velocity, uh, the, the force again, the net force again becomes zero. So in that case, the state solution will be like non zero. So the mobile, mobile state will be the only, motile state will be the only stable solution. It's blue regime in the middle. There's also a case where like the mobile state and the immobile state can coexist. They are both metastable. Now, unfortunately, we can't really theoretically uh, determine which of these two states are really more stable because this is non equilibrium system. But anyway, we can um, like find the regions in, the, in this space where uh, both mobile state and immobile states can coexist, which suggests that in those regimes, uh, there will be like these continuous phase transitions between the two states. And what is even more interesting, there can be like situations where like multiple mobile states can coexist. So the, some tracer particles can travel slowly and other tracer particles can travel more rapidly. And those regions are very, very small, but still uh, they are there. So, so far, all we have seen is like just a theoretical result based on kind of mean field approximation. But, but can you really trust them? That's the question. But we did uh, numerical simulations of the system. Uh, they did modeled using these equations. And then what you see here is that like, you know, uh, when, uh, I mean, okay, again, this is F and the velocity plane. And what you can see here is that the mean field prediction indicated by this red line is actually quite close to what the system really does in the steady state, indicated by this color, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the summer plot. And um, so provided the object mobility is substantially small, then mean field predictions are actually quite accurate. And you can even see that there seem to be like really two different kinds of transitions, like the one corresponding to the continuous transition and the other corresponding to a discontinuous transition. So the, as you can see there. So let's take a closer look at what is happening for the continuous transition. So here I'm uh, trying to um, change the, like the number of part active particles in the system while keeping the like, density at a constant value and also a little bit of caveat here is that I'm also rescaling the mobility of the uh, traveling object uh, in, inversely proportional to uh, the number of active particles here. So uh, the situation in this case becomes a bit similar to the case where you have like ising spins interacting uh, with each other or to interaction with each other, uh, uh, which can be likened to these active particles some are interacting with each other through this, um, this uh, very slow uh, object in the middle. So uh, what happens is that taking that kind of symptomatic limit, uh, you can show that uh, the system exhibits um, the Ising, uh, Ising model-like criticality uh, with like, like mean field critical exponents. Big beta equal to one over two and uh, nu bar, nu bar equal to, okay, two. Uh, yeah, so um, so this is the continuous transition. So we do have a continuous transition as supported by this uh, evidence, numerical evidence. And then like there's another transition on the right, left hand side, which looks discontinuous, but let's make sure that it's continuous. So we first of all measured uh, the how uh, the, the distribution of the, like, the density 
of um, the traveling stage that changes as we increase the system size, as the number of particles. Uh, sorry for the, a bit of the inconstancy in the order. But, then, uh, but as we increase the number of particles, we clearly see this multiple peaks developing. And if we measure the window cumulant, which is typically used as a measure of this constant transition, indicator of this constant transition, you can see that this window cumulant develops a huge dip here to the negative infinity, uh, which is usually interpreted as the distributions of the parameter having some kind of two different peaks at the transition point. So yeah, it seems like the system is really capable of this constant transition. So okay, I'm a bit over time, so uh, let me quickly summarize. So we found a simple mechanism by which an object with fixed geometry in a disordered state can become motile via symmetry breaking, and which this is because of the negative drag. And we substitute long person length and weak object particle interaction. Um, this mechanism can happen. And both kinds of continuous and concentration are possible. Now, um, here's some a bit of caveat to note here. Uh, so, in addition to this drag force exerted by the active particles, there's of course another kind of drag force exerted by object by the surrounding fluid, the, the ambient fluid. And if the drag force from the ambient force is even stronger than the effect of the active particles, then of course this kind of spontaneous mortality will not happen. So we actually need to assume that the surrounding fluid is also like, like exerting a very weak uh, friction compared to uh, this drag force exerted by the active particles. But still, um, there was some, like another research in a similar vein uh, by like the group in the Israel, and they found that this kind of negative drag mechanism, even if it is too small to induce any motion, can still give rise to some kind of anomalous fluctuations. And uh, when the system is very close to a critical line, like for example, like here, then uh, we can expect that because of the critical fluctuations associated with this Ising-like transition, uh, there's gonna be the anomalous diffusion, some kind of anomalous diffusion of the like, ob object immersed in this active fluid. And uh, also we can expect that, I mean, considering how these lines look like uh, kind of some kind of re entered behavior as we uh, cut the diagram in this direction. Um, we can sort of expect that this also has something to do with the, like the well-known experiment observation of the non-monotonic dependence of the effective diffusion coefficient on the tracer size compared to the, uh, the, 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 the person's length of the active particle. Now, so now the, the real question is whether I mean, all of this here is nice, but of course, uh, the, the real thing is whether we can observe this in any experiment. Uh, well, so I, I'm not aware of any real experimental observation of this yet, but, but there's a very similar, somewhat, somewhat similar situation, of course, a bit different, but somewhat similar situation where uh, you have this kind of like disc made of a substance called camphor, which weakens the, the surface tension of water. So if this starts to move a bit, then that creates some like density imbalance of camphor in the moving frame of this object, and then that imbalance again leads to a sort of effective negative drag, and then these this guys start to move. Of course, this in this case, we, this disk is not in an active fluid. This disk itself is an active particle, but but uh, but the, like existence of this kind of situation actually uh, gives me hope that uh, what we have predicted uh, might be uh, sort of possible. Or if you get the right uh, kind of parameters, because that is a very uh, simple mechanism. Okay, so um, so I'd like to uh, thank my students, Ki Won Kim and Yun Shik Che, who did theory and the numerics respectively. And also, um, this work was basically a product of uh, discussions with uh, Patrick Pietonka and Yari Kafi and uh, Nicolas Nicola Nicola. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd like to answer any question or comment. You have a questions? Yeah, thanks a lot for very interesting talks. So, uh, uh, so you introduced the mean field theory and the analytic solution to the the friction coefficient gamma in the oh, framework. Yeah. So, 
could you extend that argument and theory to higher dimension? To higher dimension? So uh, that's actually quite challenging. Uh, one dimension is special in that you can actually s solve this problem for any uh, potential effect. Um, that's mainly because you don't have like um, the shape of the circulating current field is very simple in one dimension. I mean, the, if there's a relation, it has to be like across the system. Uh -huh. but, yeah. but in two dimension, there's going to be like circulating current, which looks like, you know, so loops. Then, so, um, I, I wonder whether such a negative drag phenomena is also present in higher dimension, I mean, empirical, experimentally. So yeah, actually that's a good point. And um, so basically what I believe to the main intuition here is that if the active particles tend to kind of stick to the boundary of this object, then and if there's some kind of motion here, then uh, the tendency of this active particle sticking to the boundary is kind of altered in a way which aids the motion. So even in two dimension, if, if you can make the active particles kind of stick to the boundary, then I think, I think it's natural to expect a similar thing can happen. And actually we are working towards a building some MD simulation uh, which can check that. And uh, Yunshik is doing, uh, or trying hard to do that. Also you can construct some kind of Cause I want the situation, and then maybe can check this more um, easily. Any other question? If I remember correctly, you used the um, um, the one uh, first of the um, differential equation for describing this object. Right. Yeah. Right. Not yeah. the second order. Is there any reason to use that instead of the Newtonian second order differential equation? Uh, Newtonian second order equation. Okay. First of all, yeah, the reason is because it's simpler <laughs> to do the first order equation. Um, in principle, I think you can do this. For example, the I mean, you are thinking about constraint effect of inertia here uh, for the object because it is likely to be actually much more massive. So maybe experimental situation is closer to that. Uh, so that's a good question. Maybe we can do that. Uh, but I, I, uh, assume, you, I assume that you, yeah. you assume the, some overdamped limit. Yeah, we are assuming overdamped limit. Because yeah. you didn't assume any drag on this object yeah. or some of the noise on that. So we are just assuming that the drag is actually much, much bigger. And does it but, take yeah. some flow on the energy balance? Of energy balance. Yeah, of uh, this object because you have to consider all the kinetic energy and potential force of them. Um, OK, I'm not sure about the question. Um, maybe we can discuss later. Any other question? Okay, if not, uh, let's stop here. Let's thank Professor Beck.